Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. I'm really excited to speak to our next guest, someone who I've spoken with previously on Russian American issues in a, what is an interesting time to also parallel to the times that we're in. So before we get David's perspective on our current events and our current news cycle, I want to just tell you a little bit about David. David was born in Chicago. He was educated at the University of Chicago and Oxford University. And from 1972 to 1976, this is really interesting. He was a police reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And I want you to keep that in mind because he made a transition in 1976 to become Moscow correspondent for the Financial Times. And that was really key because that was at the height of Soviet power. And David really spent a great deal of his career in Russia and being a special correspondent, uh, a writer, an author, a journalist to link the West to what was actually happening inside the Soviet Union at a time that a lot of people didn't have access. And he continued to do that through the fall of the Soviet Union, which we'll ask him about. And then in 2013, he was expelled. He became the first U.S. correspondent to be barred from Russia since the Cold War, which is a title, David, I'm not sure that you necessarily expected to have on your bio, <laughs> but here it is. So was there something just kind of broad, broadly speaking, David, did you always know that you wanted to be a journalist? Did you always know that you wanted to be a foreign correspondent, go overseas somewhere and, and spend your career in that way? Well, I, uh, I started uh, out with the idea that perhaps I would go to law school. But uh, when I was in college, I went to, to work for the school paper. Uh, this was the University of Chicago Maroon, it was called. And uh, I liked it a lot. I liked, I liked the process of journalism. And I had some success with some articles that I wrote. And uh, uh, I was noticed by a very famous Washington journalist uh, by the name of Joseph Alsop, who uh, invited me to Washington and got me a job as a summer intern on the Washington Post. And from that point on, uh, I was drawn more and more into journalism, plus the fact that I was very interested always in Russia. And I would, because this, this was the era of the cold war. There were two great powers and we, you know, the United States and the Soviet union and the Soviet union claimed to be a kind of worker's paradise. So obviously I was curious. Uh, And you put those two things together, plus the fact that I I won a Rhodes Scholarship and I went to Oxford. Suddenly, uh, Russia was geographically accessible. Uh, It began to be realistic. You could get on a train in a railroad station in London, in, in, uh, I think it was Liverpool Street Station. And uh, a couple of days later, you would be... you would be in Moscow. Of course, you had to get off the train and get on a ferry to go to Holland. But in any case, you could buy a ticket from London to Moscow. And I began to travel there while I was a student. And I studied, I became interested in the language. And so one thing led to another. And when I was a police reporter in Chicago, after graduate school, uh, I, 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 I continued to have the ambition to go abroad as a foreign correspondent. And uh, just so happened that I was hired by the London Financial Times and sent. That's incredible. I can't imagine what it was like to go from a police reporter in Chicago in the 1970s and then suddenly wind up in Moscow. <laughs> you know, what well, a my transition fellow, that must my have been. Fellow colleagues, my fellow, fellow colleagues at the Chicago Tribune told me it was the fastest rise in journalistic history because <laughs> I was... I was spending, I was working midnight to eight covering police in Chicago. And I went back to Oxford to defend my thesis because during the, at that time, I had a Tuesday and Wednesday weekend and I had nothing to do. And of course, if your weekend is Tuesday and Wednesday and and you're working from midnight to eight, you don't have much of a social life. Uh, And I filled that in with uh, hard work finishing my Oxford thesis. So I went back to to, to Oxford to defend the thesis, and my thesis supervisor put me in touch with with his good friend, who was the managing editor of the London Financial Times. 
It was actually quite a story because I, I, uh, I went to see him and uh, he walked into the room and he said, where, where are we going to send you? I thought, send me. I mean, he hadn't even hired me. He doesn't know anything about me. What is he saying? Send me. And he said, do you speak any foreign languages? And so I said, well, actually, I know Russian, which was a, a, a huge exaggeration at that point. But I, what I meant to say was I know a little Russian. Uh, he said, fine, we'll send you to Moscow. And he said, listen, I'm terribly busy. I've, I've got to leave. Uh, we'll, we'll take care of all the details in a few weeks. So I was absolutely stunned by this. And I said to him, well, uh, don't you want to see something I've written? <laughs> and he looked at me for a minute and, you know, he had this kind of perplexed look on his face. And he said, yeah, send me something. <laughs> <laughs> Three <laughs> a months later, I was on my way to Moscow. You know what? Isn't that funny though, David? It is true about journalism. You could you could try your hardest. You could put the best packages together and you send it to exactly who you want to be hired and they never even look at it. And then every once in a while you get a break. And this sounds like the break of a yeah, lifetime. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So what was but it then like I living? Spent, that was, then there were six years, six years in the Soviet Union after so that. So what was that like? I mean, what was it like living in the Soviet Union at the time? Well, of course it was a completely different world. It was a world, uh, you know, it was a totalitarian dictatorship. It was a country it, at the height of its power, because the, the, Russia was never more powerful than it was compared to the rest of the world, than it was uh, in uh, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, when it was still the Soviet Union. And uh, it was like... a stepping into a giant theater of the absurd in which uh, everything was make-believe and people were forced to act it out as if it was real. And people, as a result of habit and mass psychology, lost all appreciation of the absurdity of what they were saying and doing. Uh, this is the nature of a totalitarian regime. From the outside, it looks crazy. But once, you, if you're part of it, and if 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 you're motivated by conformity and fear, uh, it can become a new normality. And I I witnessed that. I witnessed that. I witnessed how people were afraid afraid to say even one uh, one free word. I'll give you an example. There was a case of, uh, of, a, of a, an employee of Soviet radio who, began, who uh, was giving the normal news broadcast. According to the official version, the uh, Soviet army had gone into Afghanistan to give fraternal help. They had intervened in order to save Afghanistan from foreign invaders. And he began saying, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Of course, what, what he said was true. It was a Soviet invasion. But all the newspapers, all the lectures, all the radio, all the television repeated the same lie that this was fraternal help. And his, this one radio announcer saying that this was a Soviet invasion, it, was so shocking that a friend of mine who was driving at the time said he heard it on his radio. He was so stunned, he almost ran off the road. So that's the power of mass conformity. Uh, the, uh, what was it like the to be a journalist during that time, though, David? Were you able to do your work? What Was a lot of your work making these observations and then writing more columns? Or how, how did you even go about being a journalist in that sort of environment? And were you able to work? Did the government a allow you to, to work? Well, first of all, there was an attempt to expel me in 1979. And that this was the, the, the successful expulsion in 2013 was actually my second uh, encounter with the, with the Russian authorities. Uh, in 1979, the British and American governments both sprang to my defense, and they threatened to expel Russian 
so-called journalists, were Soviet so-called journalists, but in fact, intelligence agents. And the Soviets decided that it wasn't worth losing two agents just for me. And so I was able to stay. That was kind of a remarkable and, and an unusual uh, episode. And the, uh, but it was possible to, to be a journalist. In fact, uh, the Soviets, because they were pretending to be a democracy, allowed much more opportunity for initiative by journalists than, than, than people realized. Again, there, there were only about uh, 30% of the territory of the country uh, that was closed to journalists. The rest you could, in theory, visit if you were ready to go alone and take your chances. Most of the journalists followed uh, a program that was organized for them by the authorities. Many of them didn't speak Russian. Many of them didn't have contacts with the society. Many of them were unhappy to be there because they found it boring and uninteresting. And they, they went because it was important for their careers to, to be able to say that well, I was in Moscow for a couple of years. But I, I had a completely different approach, uh, partially maybe because of just just different kind of person. I, I, I regarded my job as, you know, my source of income, kind of like my day job. And I decided that my responsibility was to learn everything I could about this country, uh, whether it fit into the requirements of my job or not. And I found that there, you know, despite everything, despite the fear, despite the conformity, uh, you know, despite the, the sheer inconvenience and hardship of, of Soviet life, that there were a surprising number of people who were ready to talk to me and tell me about their lives. And that's how I gathered the information for my first book, which is called uh, Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I, I sensed at the time that this was a historically unique situation and I wanted people to tell me about their lives, what they had gone through, what they endured, you know, how they saw the world. And I, 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 I took extensive notes and that was the basis, for, you know, for my first book. What was notable about the time during the Soviet Union through the collapse, and then the Russia that emerged? Well, the Soviet Union, the, what characterized the Soviet Union was the ideology. Uh, an, an ideology is a, a concept that's imposed on reality and treated as truer than reality, in, in effect. Uh, that ideology in the case of the Soviet Union was Marxism-Leninism. And uh, very few people, even, even in the Soviet Union, really understood what this ideology was all about. And in fact, when I began reading textbooks about Marxism-Leninism, some of my fellow correspondents, my colleagues, thought I was crazy to spend time trying to understand the ideology. Um, but in reality, that was the key to the whole system. That was what was taught to kids in the school. That was the basis of schools. That was the basis of the institutions. That was the justification for the regime. And uh, that was the, the script for the play that people were forced to act out in their daily lives. They were forced to act out the citizens of the happy Soviet Union, which had created heaven on earth, uh, and in which there was no class conflict, there was no war, there was no uh, exploitation of the masses, uh, there was perfect justice, there was perfect democracy. That was the script. Of course, it had nothing to do with the reality. But that script was dictated by Marxism-Leninism that said if you had a revolution and you took all the property away from the property owners and put it in the hands of the state, you would have a perfect democracy. You would have the end of class conflict, et cetera, et cetera. So 
no one could admit that that had not happened. Uh, they had to, everything was organized on the assumption that it had happened. So when, let's say, they took a vote at a factory, uh, uh, about some policy that was announced by the ruling Politburo. Uh, they said, now they got together and say, okay, well, we're now all going to vote uh, on the policy which has been announced by the Central Committee of the Communist Party uh, for further achievements in the realm of socialist construction. Uh, now, we the workers, do we support this policy? And you know, everybody raises their hands without exception. They say, yes, we support it. Uh, now, if, if some wise guy were to say, no, I don't support it, that would be the beginning of all kinds of trouble for him. And nobody wanted that trouble. And if he really persisted, he could end up in a mental hospital. He could end up in a labor camp. But usually it didn't go that far. People didn't want trouble at work. And so everybody was you know, everybody voted yes. Same thing with the, the parliament, the Supreme, so-called Supreme Soviet. They would vote on a law, and in every single case, the parliament voted unanimously in favor, with no exceptions. So, you know, this was, this was, and so, and of course, what was it that made people do this? First of all, it was conformity the terrible power of mass conformity, which is something that we have to be aware of when we think about events in the US. Uh, but behind that mass conformity was fear because so many people had been killed uh, in the society and it, the society was terrorized. Uh, and even though by the time I got to the Soviet Union, the terror had diminished, there were, you know, that you could still, there were, there were still uh, many ways in which the authorities could intimidate a person, including just eliminating him without, you know, without charges or trial or anything else, just arranging an accident. And so murdering, murdering that person. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and under those circumstances, very few people are heroes in any society. And after what they had gone through in the Soviet Union with the mass repressions under Stalin, it was easier just to go along. It was easier just to raise your hand and say, I support the wise decisions of the Central Committee and just be done with it. Uh, and... Uh, so, but, but of course, as a foreign correspondent and as someone who, you know, I mastered the Russian language, which is not an easy thing to do, actually. Uh, and as someone who, you know, I was young, single, it was a long time ago, and I, I traveled freely uh, and, 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 and talked to people. I could see it from the outside. And that was what, on the one hand, I saw what was going on because I understood it from people's stories about their lives. I could listen to what they were telling me, but I wasn't part of it. I wasn't, I wasn't vulnerable the way they were. And so I, 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 I had a perspective that was different. And that, that's what I tried to capture in my books and what I try to capture to this day in my writing. Well, and the reason why I'm asking you these questions is because this thinking that Vladimir Putin would like to return Russia to the Soviet Union is a is a common theme that we hear time and time again in the American press. But you have a little bit of a different take on it as well that adds to it. And this picture of what the Soviet Union was like is really an important foundational piece for our conversation. Was there a moment, you know, without I know we could have we could have hour long uh, conversations, David, about the history of the Soviet Union, but was there a moment where the collapse happened? I mean, can you can you pinpoint the moment where you, you said this is the collapse that happened and this is the new Russia that emerged? Was the new Russia that different than the Soviet Union? Was the, was there a real sea change, or was there not? 
Those are the, I, the, the, I'm, those are great questions. Um, and I'm glad that you, you, you mentioned this, the fact that uh, commentators are saying that Putin wants to restore the Soviet Union. Many of those commentators are, themselves don't know what the Soviet Union was. Well, and uh, many of them have never been to Russia. That's and listen, many have we, never been to Russia. <laughs> they, they, they are. Right. No, we have a, one of we have. You know, if 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 uh, if people in the Soviet Union were obliged only to say one thing, we have a problem in which in our country in which people say anything and it's just taken seriously. Uh, but let we can deal with that. We will point. deal with that. Yes, we will. Uh, but but let's the, go, is, the, was there the, that moment, David, there where there was, was a change? The, the moment there, I mean, people, every person has their own moment when it was, when they thought that was it. Uh, and uh, for me, the moment was when they began publishing truthful information in the press. Uh, a, a newspaper came out and said, uh, that uh, Russian uh, Soviet citizens spend, uh, I re don't remember the exact figure, but let's say a million hours in standing in line or two million. I don't know what the, what the figure was. They gave some fantastic number of hours that Soviet citizens spend standing in line. Well, the Soviet system was supposed to be perfect. The Soviet system is based on a scientific ideology. Soviet Union had eliminated all problems. What's this talk that millions of people have no, have no alternative but to stand in line? Then they began publishing articles about prostitution. I said, what is going on here? There's no uh, uh, um, uh, prostitution in the Soviet Union. In fact, you, people, you know, a lot of people started cursing. They said, do you see what Gorbachev's glasnost has done? Now we have prostitution. Of course, there was always prostitution. They just never, there was no, no information about it. There was uh, one, one woman I knew was in a class and a lecturer came in and said, uh, you know, the, um, we're going to have to have changes in this country because we've always tried to catch up and surpass America, but America has entered a new phase of the scientific technical revolution and we can't compete with them. We're falling behind. All the people who were in that class came out as if they, you know, if they had seen a ghost, they was completely shocked. No one ever said in an official form that the Soviet Union was or even could be falling behind. So when they began to tell the truth for their own purposes in the hope that that would help them reform the system, I, I, I knew that, that, you know, that the system was doomed because the system could not survive uh, exposure to the truth. And all the fault lines in the system began to be exposed. The conflicts between the nationalities, the oppression of the workers, the disagreements within the party structure, which had always been totally monolithic. And suddenly, you know, this, 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 this monolith that it seemed, which seemed impregnable and which appeared capable of lasting forever, suddenly began to fall apart. And it fell apart so faster than anyone could ever imagine. Because the ideology, the lies that had held it together began to be discredited. When people began to hear the, the real truth about the country's history, about all the crimes that were committed, about the true conditions in the country, they didn't want to live under those conditions. And that was ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. What emerged in its place? What, is, what would be the modern Russian political system that the government is set well, up? The, the, what, they, what, they, what, they, what was in its place was a, a, a state that was democratic in structure, but in need of complete social and economic reform. And that 
set about reforming it without the benefit of the rule of law. They decided that they would take property which had been held by the state and give it to private individuals. But there were no legal, no re reasonable legal procedures for doing that. And the property ended up in the hands of criminals who were close to, you know, who were capable of bribing or intimidating officials, as well as, or, or, you know, gangsters. And that set the, the, the basis for the Russia of today. Criminal did, oligarchy took well, over the country's property. So when was the first time that you heard the name Vladimir Putin when you were inside the country? When, when did that name start being talked 1999. about? 1999. 1999, when he was appointed prime minister. I had not heard of him before that. He, I, I, there was vaguely some recollection that a guy with that name was head of the, K, the FSB, which was the successor organization to the KGB. But, uh, and then this is a very important thing. Uh, uh, suddenly, after going through four prime ministers, Yeltsin hit upon a fifth, and that Vladimir Putin, as some of you, he was completely unprepossessing. He had no political experience. He had no charisma. Uh, he spoke poorly. He was inarticulate. Uh, he seemed awkward. The press ridiculed the choice. And his approval rate rating was 2%, which was exactly the same approval rating that Yeltsin had after uh, eight years of extremely destructive reforms. On September 8th, 1999, Yeltsin called Bill Clinton and told him that, you know, we've appointed this prime minister, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's a good man. He's going to be the next president. Uh, you're going to work with him. You'll find him a good partner. September 9th, the first apartment building in Moscow is blown up. Uh, there was a question in my mind at that time, how Yeltsin could be so sure with a, an approval rating of 2% that he was in a position to nominate and, and, and guarantee uh, the next president of Russia. But uh, apartment buildings began to be blown up in the middle of the night. Just randomly, uh, just you, just random. You would just go to, you would just go to sleep at night, and just a yeah, random right. they, apartment building would just, were just blow up, blown to bits, and, and the the bombs were placed to to uh, were time to go off at five in the morning, and um, the whole te whole country was terrorized, and uh, Putin suddenly was everywhere on television, announcing announcing that he would exact bloody revenge for these attacks by terrorists on innocent Russian people. The, uh, and those, and they, the, the, the accused were the, were the Chechens who had already fought a war for independence and had kind of uh, an independent but unrecognized state uh, and that was and they, the just and they were just to be clear about that because people may hear Chechens. Uh, we've talked about Chechnya before, but uh, predominantly Muslim area. David yeah. corrected. It's and, a, in and, the Caucasus. It's a it's a Muslim area in the in the Caucasus that fought that traditionally would fought for its independence and fought a, a war in the 1990s against the Russians to achieve independence and in fact achieved it. They defeated the Russians in the first Chechen war. But in Russia, and, it would be a quote unquote known enemy. This was a known quote unquote known enemy. Oh, that would be so, the one that would much, be Very sent. much so. And a convenient right. scapegoat for everything. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they launched, they had prepared and they launched a new war against Chechnya. And that war was successful partially because they used banned weapons, weapons of mass destruction in a so-called anti-terrorist operation. But that war uh, boost sent Putin's popularity soaring. 
uh, he was suddenly no longer a stooge who had been selected specifically to protect the corrupt Yeltsin family. Uh, on the contrary, and the results of privatization and of property in Russia, which were also corrupt. On the contrary, he was the defender of the motherland against terrorists who were so cruel that they would blow up people as they ordinary Russian people, ordinary working people, and they would murder them in their beds. Uh, and he was the defender. There were four explosions, 300 people were murdered. Uh, and uh, do you think the, it was the Chechens, the, David? Pardon me? Do you think it was the Chechens that? Well, no, and I'll come to that. that because there was a fifth bomb that was placed in the by basement of a building in Riazan. That building was on, that, that bomb was uncovered before it could explode and it was deactivated. It had a live military detonator. It had, it was, it, 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 it com was composed of the same high explosive hexagon that was used in the four previous bombings, the successful bombings. And the three people who placed the bomb in the Biff building, because there was a huge dragnet in the city, the whole city was cordoned off. Uh, pictures of those people who had been seen putting the bomb in the building were in every store, in every window, every shop window. Uh, and they were captured. And they turned out not to be Chechen terrorists. They turned out to be agents of the FSB. So, I um, mean, if that doesn't constitute overwhelming evidence, I don't know what does. They were caught red-handed putting a live bomb in, the, in an apartment building that was identical to the bombs that had gone off in other cities. But the, the, the Russian authorities said that this was a training exercise. It was a test of vigilance for the population and that the bomb was made of sugar, not hexagon. And they took it away be, uh, you know, before anyone could, could really get their hands on it, although it had been tested positive for hexagon before they got, got to it. So uh, they said that the, the equipment was faulty and gave a false result. but. Um, you know, it's, it's fairy tales. So, um, oh. so that's an. You think this is a critical part of this? This has been a deep part of your reporting. This is the most critical part of post post uh, post communist Russian history, because Putin came to power because of an act of terror against his own people. And had that bomb gone off in Ryazan, it would have not only destroyed a building uh, that was that that was home to four hundred people. But that building was located on a hill, on an elevation, and it would have, the, the, the debris would have hit the, the neighboring building with the force of an avalanche, and it would have taken, and it would have destroyed that building too. It was another 400 people. But the, thank God that it didn't happen, but it was, but the war in Chechnya, Chechnya had already been launched. Uh, in fact, the, the day after the, those bombs were discovered, the Air Force, the Russian Air Force began bombing Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. But that was, pro that was planned in advance. They, it would have been much more dramatic if it had, had, had happened after the, a successful bombing. So let me, let, end, me a, let me ask you an mm -hmm. obvious question then. Why would, why would Vladimir Putin want to do that? Why would the Russian government want to bomb its own people? What would, what would be the strategy there? They had no choice. They had no choice if they didn't want to lose power. People told me that Yeltsin was prepared to blow up half of Moscow uh, to protect his corrupt family. And the and here's where we get to the to the real core of the problem, which is these experiences in the Soviet Union, this experience of living in a play, of acting out a lie, of ha giving up all responsibility for your life of rejecting the notion that the individual has some moral responsibility and, and accepting the idea that people are raw material for the realization of a, the regime's objectives. Well, that creates a psychology in which, you know, uh, they're just collateral damage. You know, who cares? Who cares how many people we kill? Where the important thing is power. That's why Putin is so dangerous. And that's how he got it. And, and it's also fact that our government had information about this. 
and decided to remain silent. I, I think it's quite amusing that uh, Madeleine Albright, the former uh, uh, Secretary of State, has a piece in the, in the New York Times, an op-ed, that Putin is giving up the opportunity to be a great leader, as I, as I read it, as I recall it, uh, and will go down in infamy. As if someone who, and she should have been aware, she was the one who you know, had to have been part of the decision not to raise this issue. Uh, she should have been aware that there was never any chance that he could be a great leader, having come to power in that way. And had we raised that issue at the time, and I can understand the hesitation to do so, we wouldn't have the crisis we're having to, we have today. Why do you or understand the hesitation? Had, why do you understand? Why do you understand the hesitation to do so at the time? Because without- bureaucrats are very are very timid people, first of all, and uh, uh, the here you've got a guy who's just carried out a terrorist act against his own people, and he's coming to power in a country that that is that is one of the biggest arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, this you know, we we start talking about this, and there could be chaos in the country. Uh, and you know, you know, on the other hand, you know, there are risks in not talking about it. We not only did we not talk about it, we we willed ourselves to forget it. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why I was expelled from Russia was because I insisted on not forgetting it. I wanted to know more about that story about was that was this reporting the reason why in 2013? Yeah, that was the most. Well, that was the most important reason. That was how did how do you get expelled, David? Like, what is the process for getting expelled? Do does someone just show up at your door and say it's time for you to go and you have to leave? Did you leave an entire apartment behind just as it was? How does that even happen? Well, I had they. I had to renew my visa. Uh, which is a normal bureaucratic procedure. You have to do that outside the country. And they just didn't let me back in, even though my apartment, I had my apartment, my accreditation, you know, everything there. So they, 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 they said that I, they read, they read a statement to me that um, according to the competent organs, and that's a phrase that they use for the intelligence services for the FSB, your presence on the territory of the Russian Federation is undesirable and you're banned from the country. Simple as that. It was read to me by a diplomat. What went I had your my, mind? My, my, son had, uh, my, 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 my son had to go to Moscow with a bunch of big suitcases and clean out my apartment, take everything out of there. Had to settle settle with the landlady, you know, just the usual things. What, right. So, what, it's just usual, as you mentioned, just getting expelled. Sort of I mean, usual. Sort it's of usual. Sort of usual. It's, I understand this idea, though, of being in an extraordinary situation and still being required to do very mundane tasks. What went through your mind, though, when when this was being read to you? Did you really realize this could be it? I'm not ever going to be able to go back to Russia because you haven't been able well, to I go had back. A, I had then. a feeling I had, you know, the, the Moscow Times wrote an article about this under the heading uh, David Satter, the Kremlin's Bete Noir. Uh, and they said that uh, it's not surprising he was expelled. It's surprising it took so long. <laughs> and <laughs> and the uh, I I realized it would be a long time before I could go back to Russia, but I also realized that they were too late. That after so many years I had of of study and 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 dedication to the country and its people, that I they could not prevent me from telling the truth about what was going on there, even even by expelling me. It's so, interesting. It's interesting to hear your perspective, David, too, about you knew the fall of the Soviet Union was coming when the press was becoming more free. And yeah. I wonder, with your experience, if you also see a similar chapter starting for Russia when you see the press 
become less free, meaning that you were not allowed to stay in the country in 2000. That was, and some people have said, you know, in Russia, in Russian, you don't speak Russian, but there's a the uh, phrase "perve elastichka." It means the first swallow. Uh, is some people that said that I was the Pervaya Lostichka after the Euromaidan revolt in Kiev. I, I had the honor of being the first person against whom repressive action was taken. Now, many more, I was far from the last, but um, it was kind of a harbinger of what was to come. Did you feel that your life was threatened, David, working in Russia or even after you were working in Russia? Have, Russia, have you felt that physically threatened by your work? That's an interesting question. I mean, people who've done the same thing that I did were killed. Uh, people who wrote about the apartment bombings. There was one night in particular when I got a call that uh, Sergei Yushenkov had been murdered outside of his apartment block. And he and I had been talking just a couple of weeks earlier in the State Duma about you know, the revelations that he was going to make about the apartment bombings and that I was making at the same time for an American audience. And when I, when I heard that, I was really shaken that he had been, mur he had been murdered. As Yuri Shekhachikhan, a Russian journalist, also a close friend of mine. I have a book that he wrote uh, and it was inscribed to me, it says, for David, we are still alive in 2003. Well, he was murdered in 2004. So uh, I, you know, I understood the danger, but I thought my feeling was that they would want to leave me alone simply for a couple of reasons. I couldn't be sure, by the way. Uh, first of all, just as an American, you know, it, there's a higher, you know, you know, take, you know, to, to, to take some action against an American as opposed to one of their own citizens. It's, it's a different level of risk. It's a different level of, inv of involvement politically. And also, you know, in the field, in the field, I'm, I'm pretty well known. And uh, they're trying to support the pretext that they're kind of a democracy. So it would look ridiculous if someone who was well-known uh, writer on Russian and Soviet affairs uh, is 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 the victim of some sort of violence. But I was I, I there was nothing overt. But I of course you know just by judging what happened to other people. In fact, many people told me that they that they thought that the Russian authorities by expelling me were doing me a favor. Mm. Because uh, they have other ways of dealing with people, hmm. and uh, as for the you know the post expulsion period, uh, well let's know, let's, not, let's take a like let's take a breath on this, David, because it, it is interesting, and I just want to note uh, to our audience that I told David that we would talk for thirty minutes, and here we are. There's no way we're talking for thirty minutes because he's too good to talk to, and he's the the journalist to talk to on this topic. But the background is so critical, David. It's actually missing from the entire news cycle in America right now. Any sort of background that you just talked to us about, and so in 2013, you're expelled. Um, this is during the Obama administration. During, uh, 2014 is a year we've been talking a lot about because that had, was the year of the Russian invasion. And again, coming back to that word, who calls something an invasion or not has, was critical at that time. It's also critical in the news cycle we're in now. So in that Russian invasion, not to speed through it, but you had an uprising of, of people in Ukraine. You had an overthrow of the government there that's controversial and a lot to pick apart. Russia comes in, takes Crimea, and then you have these contested areas Eastern Ukraine that remain contested. We're fighting between Russian-backed separatists and Ukrainian. The Ukrainian military has continued. So um, I know that's kind of a brief overview, but here, here we are now. And so you're seeing this play out with your set of experience that's unlike anybody else. As you're watching the events unfold over the last several weeks, you know what was going through your mind? What parallels do you see? And what do you think people should know? Well, uh, as I've mentioned in various places, the Putin regime is growing old. Uh, it's been 22 years. 
growing old as in, in age, or is it just not aging well for the, the Russian public? Well, I think both. Hmm. Uh, it's becoming more corrupt, more lawless, and at the same time, more vulnerable. Pete, there's a, there's a level of frustration in the population. Uh, it's reflected in the reaction to Alexei Navalny, the anti-corruption blogger who now faces a second prison term while he's already in prison. He's not even going to be brought to Moscow for trial. It was reflected in protests. It was uh, over the falsified elections in 2011. For the moment, they've been able, you know, for, for the time being, they've been able to damp it down. But we saw what happened in Belarus when there was a falsified election and, and the, what happened in Ukraine, the Euro Maidan revolt, was an absolute nightmare from, for the point, from the point of view of the Russian leaders. Because there were 200, 300, 400,000 people on the street. That's the kind of force that's capable of bringing down the regime. And they know it. And that was the reason why they launched that invasion of, of eastern Ukraine and they, the seizure of, of Crimea, just as they wanted to blow up the buildings to change the subject. So they invaded uh, east U Ukraine and seized Crimea so that Russians would not draw the necessary lessons or the obvious lessons from the Euromaidan revolt, which is that if people take part in a democratic, spontaneous, self-organizing demonstration, they are capable of overthrowing a kleptocratic regime. That's the last thing the Russian leaders wanted the Russian people to see and understand. So it's better to appeal to their primitive nationalism. And that's what happened with the with with Crimea, that's what happened in eastern, eastern, eastern Ukraine. Is that what's and, happening now? Uh, and Is that's what's happening now, by the way. That's what's happening now. The, the uh, Putin saw when we betrayed uh, Afghanistan, and uh, I know that, every, that both parties in our country are saying, uh, well, it was a good idea to leave Afghanistan, but, uh, you know, we would have done it better. Each one probably says they would have done it better. I don't know if they, you know, uh, the Republicans say they would have done it better. The Democrats say they did it well enough. I don't know. But the point is, they're both wrong. Uh, it was impossible to betray an entire people that way. And it would have been a, a minimal effort for us to protect them. It's interesting that Afghanistan had the status of most trusted, close, close uh, American ally, the, the highest designation after being a, a second to being a member of NATO. And it was to that status that Ukraine aspired until they saw how, how little that status was worth. Um, and the, 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 the moronic justifications for uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're against endless wars. Uh, you know, we, you know, what are people talking about? Uh, are, we, are we against guaranteeing our own security uh, when faced with an endless jihad? Uh, so how, the, how, do you, the, how do you think this decision was perceived, David? That Why do you think that was such a critical Nothing else, story had changed. The... Nothing else had changed in the Ukrainian situation. There was no move to make Ukraine a member of NATO at all. That was completely off the table. The, the, the fighting along the line of contact in eastern Ukraine was practically was at a very low level. There was no obvious source of conflict. There was no obvious reason to raise the issue of Ukraine except the perception that the United States was so weak and so uh, feckless in its attitude toward its allies that, uh, that it would be possible to intimidate Ukraine and uh, uh, subordinate it. The, the, this is uh, you know, a lesson that, that 
that Americans need to learn that the behavior of the United States in one place has consequences for the behavior of our adversaries in other places. In any case, that was what that's what started it. And 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 Putin had a long-standing need to to consolidate the people of Russia around his corrupt rule, which he understood uh, was vulnerable in the long term. And I talked about some of the reasons in that Wall Street article, Wall Street Journal article, but but but. Uh, let me read. Let me read from that. Actually, David, you, the title of it is "Weakness at Home Drives Putin to Invade Ukraine." And you started with Russia's preparation to invade Ukraine and threats of nuclear war should come as no surprise. Vladimir Putin is ready to resort to a level of blackmail not seen since the days of the Soviet Union, because threatening war is the most effective way for him to consolidate support for his regime. Yeah, well, that's. That's why that's why they went to that's why they're doing what they're doing now. uh, They can go too far. If he thinks that he can get away with invading. uh, uh, It's very likely he, he would. The fact is that. History should have taught the Russians, including the history of the first Chechen war, that the cost of invading will not be insignificant. It will be years of guerrilla war and you know thousands of deaths and a drain on the Rus- Ru- Russian economy, which is already not in great shape. It'll be the isolation of Russia. If if you know, Vladimir Putin can you can you imagine a man who is rewarded for blowing up 300 of his own people by becoming the wealthiest person on earth and the absolute ruler of, of a giant country. Uh, can you imagine the thought process and the, you know, that we're, we now have to deal with and the, the, the mentality and the personality. So making predictions about what's going on in that, in that cranium, uh, that's uh, pretty risky. But I think if he has even an ounce of common sense, there's not going to be a massive invasion. He'll understand that that will be the end. That could be the end for him, too. It wouldn't be because he cares about sparing human life. He doesn't care about that. Neither did Yeltsin. It'll be because uh, because he's worried, because it, he, he, it has been explained to him or he realizes that it will rebound against him and threaten his regime. You give us a lot to think about. So we're in a situation in, in the course of this last year where there's two things going on as you see it. You see that there are some that perceive America's leadership as weak and are going to try to take advantage of, of vulnerabilities that they see, but also that there is an environment inside of Russia where those in leadership also need to coalesce the public and rally support. You mentioned yeah. something that happened after 2014 and the annexation of Crimea that maybe a lot of Americans don't realize. A period of about five years, you say, in Russia, where there was a, a distinct change in attitude that you think is part of the there reason was, there why was Vladimir- patriotic u- euphoria. Patriotic and euphoria. Was- yeah, and that 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 or nationalist euphoria, uh, the, and that boosted the the status of of Putin to unprecedented levels, uh, because because uh, people became convinced. People in Russia, when they were acting out the the ideological play, when they were reduced to the level of pawns or just cogs in a machine, uh, they consoled themselves that, well, we're part of a great power. And I I told this anecdote in the piece in the Wall Street Journal that I was once standing in a line in Moscow and a guy started shouting, you know, how long can we stand in these lines? How long can this go on? And an old woman turned to him and said, never you mind, the whole world is afraid of us. Well, Russians loved the idea that they inspired fear. 
And then the Soviet Union fell and nobody was afraid anymore. Uh, and now Putin is trying to, to, to regain control over his own population by showing them that he can make the world afraid. He can make Russia the center of attention. He can force diplomats all over the world to scurry around desperately trying to, to, to uh, settle a crisis which he created. It's, um, it's a sad aspect of the psychology of the nation. And it could be counteracted if we were capable of reminding Russia of Putin's atrocities. But we don't, you know, our leaders, you see the, the, the level of the commentary, you see the level of the, of, the, of the policy. I mean, even someone like Madeleine Albright, for heaven's sakes, how can she write something like that in the New York well, Times? Well, it's something that we've had the benefit of seeing, and it's been obviously challenging as at time as, as an American citizen is over the last 20, 30 years, we have seen very dramatic differences in American leadership. We've seen Republicans, we've seen Democrats, we've seen, you know, absolutely contrasting styles of leadership. And all of these leaders and their administrations, Democrat and Republican, criticisms of all of them have emerged. They've all engaged Vladimir Putin at one time or another. And so I'm wondering how we can be more effective, David, because we've had some experience, right? We've had experience with this. We don't, we so, don't learn from our experience. So how do we uh, learn? We, because we're sanctioning him right now. We're sanctioning Russia. That's our first step. We've talked, we've done a lot of sanctions in the past. What do you think is the most effective way for America to engage Vladimir Putin? Well, it's late in the game. After the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, I wrote a piece arguing that no that 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 uh, no Western airport should accept Russian state aircraft. That Putin should be subjected to individual sanctions. Uh, you know, every sanction it exacts a cost not just on the Russians, but on people in the West who pay, end up paying for it. Let's say that um, uh, the Russians are taken off the SWIFT system of, of bank, bank transfers. Well, they can't pay on debts that they hold to a lot of people in the West who will, who will suffer. I mean, that's an example, but but you know, it's across the board. When after the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, President, it was then President Carter, announced the grain embargo. Of course, a lot of people who had made deals to export grain, they suffered as a result in the West uh, because those contracts could no longer, you know, were, were, could no longer be honored. Um, it takes will. It takes will. And yeah, it takes, and it, but the most important thing, it has to be con accompanied by the willingness to to speak the truth about the regime's crimes. And uh, we saw when President Biden was said, well, is, is Putin a killer? And he said, yeah, sort of, you know, sort of nodded his head. Uh, he, it's obvious, and even those people who, who make that statement, I mean, Hillary Clinton made that statement, uh, uh, Various senators have made that statement, but none of them go into the specifics, probably because they don't know them. And so it's a rather it's a, it's a little bit like children calling names on the playground instead of calling out the actual crimes that were committed and explaining what happened. For example, as I explained with the apartment bombings, uh, you know, it too, too often resembles just a shallow epithet. So, um, but by 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 making clear that we under, uh, understand uh, the regime's crimes, the Russian regime's crimes, and basing policy on on a certain commitment to honorability. For example, you don't just turn over an entire nation to to demented Islamic fanatics, as we did in the case of. Of, of 
of, of Afghanistan. You don't get into inane arguments over whether it could have been, you know, because it could have been done better. Uh, it's something that should not have been done at all. Uh, and understand that, and make it clear to, to, to potential adversaries, the country has principles and will act on them. That's the best deterrence there is. That will, that will, that will, and it is a question of deterrence. And deterrence, you know, means avoidance of war. War breaks out when a country, when deterrence fails. And when people with the moral level of Vladimir Putin think they can get away with something. Uh, and they, they do that on the basis of a judgment of their adversary. Uh, deterrence always has a strong psychological element. In any case, I mean, the willingness to speak the truth shows, first of all, that you're not afraid to tell the truth. Second of all, that you know the truth. And third of all, that you're under no illusions about your adversary. It seems to be a recurring theme. Those are all theme of very the important. Those are all very important factors. And a recurring theme of our conversation about the power yeah. of speaking freely and honestly and fact-based. Quick, I have just two final questions for you, David, and you've been so generous with your time. One of the, one of the questions that we've received repeatedly is, is why does Ukraine matter to the, to the American public? You know, what, what, why are we even getting involved here? This isn't even a, a part of NATO. Uh, this, you know, th these skirmishes between these two groups date back years. I mean, it'll sound very familiar for other conflicts that we've confronted. But how would you describe why Ukraine matters to the West? And what do you think the stakes are here on this particular situation and its potential ramifications? Well, the most, um, most important contributing principle to, the, to the, what has been now almost eight decades of peace uh, since the Second World War is the universal acceptance of the notion of the inviolability of uh, borders, territorial borders, that one nation cannot seize the territory of another nation. It's an important thing because there are there are quarrels all over the world. Uh, and were it to, were it to start, uh, there are lots of places where people uh, could see the opportunity to just hack off a part of the, you know, a neighboring country. Uh, the United States is the world's most powerful country and the world's most powerful democracy. For all our faults uh, are the old, we are the only country that's in a position to back up this principle and to organize the world to defend it. A flagrant violation of that principle means that we're not ready to defend that principle. And if we're not ready to, to defend it for countries that are members of uh, that are not members of NATO, it's very likely that we'll hesitate to, to defend it for. for in the case of countries that are uh, members of NATO, under conditions in which it's difficult or inconvenient for us. Now, the US overall has a, a pretty significant strategic advantage over Russia, but there are areas in which Russia actually has a strategic advantage. One of them is in the Baltic Republics. Uh, but the Baltic, we're committed to the defense of the Baltic Republics. And uh, Russia has the ability to overrun the Baltic Republic simply for reasons of geography. Uh, if we weaken our commitment to deterrence in the case of Ukraine, we increase the temptation for Russia to take over the Baltics. And were they to do that, they would render the entire NATO alliance uh, uh, an, empty, an empty shell. Because we would have, we would have failed we would have failed to 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 fulfill our, our defensive obligation. Then all of the nations that were members of NATO would then begin to make deals with the aggressive power, and the balance of power in Europe would switch would would 
would shift to a country ruled by a man who was capable of carrying out acts of terror against his own people in order to take power. And it isn't just a question of, 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 of threatening the remaining countries that might be allied with the U.S. It's also the idea that uh, they, could, they could consider they now have free reign to commit crimes anywhere. We, they're already carrying out assassinations in Western Europe. I mean, Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned in London on British soil with a nuclear isotope. We don't want a situation in which uh, people like the rulers of Russia are, are in a position to do whatever they want to their own citizens and to our citizens as well. And we don't want to be in a situation in which we might be subjected to blackmail and unable to resist because of the balance, because the balance of power had shifted so decisively against us. That's why the, 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 the conflict that's being played out in, in, in Ukraine, and by the way, the conflict that was played out in Afghanistan as well, those, those, those are conflicts that are critical to our own defense and to, to a defense of the, of, of the kind of world that we're trying to preserve. preserve. That's why it matters. That was an incredible summary, David. I don't think I've heard it said so succinctly and, and so many dots connected. And I really appreciate that. And we were able to do that because you shared so much with us at the beginning of. I was able impression. to do it. I'll tell you a secret because yes. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and and I, I without, without in, you know, because of me, you know, to get the truth, you have to want the truth and you have to be capable of understanding it anyway. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great compliment yeah. coming from you. I really appreciate it. Um, I have, I obviously have about a hundred more questions, but I actually am going to let you go <laughs> because I, well, I we think can do it I, another, we we're going to do, do it we another, time. another time. We will meet another time. Yes. You're in Paris. You're working from Paris. And I know that you'll, you'll come back. To no, the but States I'll be in well Washington. Got, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't spend all my time in Paris. Uh, I, in fact, I spend most, I'm mostly I'm in Washington. Well, let me ask you that really, real quick. And this is a little bit of a diversion, but you made a comment at the beginning of the interview that I think would probably perk up the ears of our listeners. And I don't want to forget it. You said that the conformity that you saw in the Soviet Union um, reminded you, or it said it was, you said it's something to the effect that it was important for us to pay attention to here in the United States. And I was curious what you meant by that. It's probably a, another <laughs> a bag of worms. It's a whole but other you, subject. But I'll it's tell another you, subject. But can you give us a little bit of it? Because I think that will. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that the dissidents in the Soviet Union, uh, who we wrote about in the press, were a tiny, insignificant minority. In all, at the height of the Soviet rule, there were maybe 100, 200 political prisoners. And remember, the country had a population of 350 million. Most of the people never went that far. Mostly, uh, conformity was imposed not by labor camps, not by arrests, not by beatings, although those did happen, not by psychiatric hospitals. They were imposed just because the, there was control at every place of work. Uh, you said the wrong thing at your workplace, uh, and you were called in by the first department, which belonged, you know, which was under the control of the of the FSD, uh, where they had all the personnel records, and they and uh, they said it was reported that some you said such and such a thing at such and such a time. You it evinced anti-Soviet sentiments. You praised the capitalist system. You said people live better in the West. Uh, you know, these anti-Soviet remarks are incompatible with work in our Soviet collective. And as a result, the person is, is, is fired from his job and is left to spend the rest of his life, uh, you know, working at manual labor. And the threat of that was more than enough to silence the whole country. Now we have a situation, we, we're, we're developing an informer culture in the, in, in the U.S. Of course, some people say it was for the best of motives, but 
But you know, people are reporting every things that someone said once, or to, you know, in, in the social media or to a friend or something. And uh, there's no, apology is never good enough, of course, uh, even if an apology is 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 offered and it's and is appropriate. You know, the the person has to be kind of annihilated. Well, okay, do that, and you're going to impose silence, uh, in which. People will not be sincere about what they're saying, will not be free to express themselves much better, and and will be and will be anxious to cover their tracks. And you'll and it will be enforced not by people who are qualified to enforce it, but by you know who, you know the the executives of 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 Intel, Google, Coca Cola, the last people you know Twitter, God knows the last people who would be qualified you know, to make those judgments. And uh, so this, so the mechanism, you know, the, this, is, this is something to keep bear in mind for the U.S. This is subject for an entirely yes. separate conversation. <laughs> it is, but I thought it was interesting. I wanted to think about, it gives us something to think about at the end of an interview, which is always a good thing. I just want to mention that you have a new book out as well. You've written many books, but this one is a collection of your, your work over the years in the Soviet Union, uh, Never Speak to Strangers and Other Writing from Russia in the Soviet Union. And that, I mean, has to be a must read at this point. David, I do look forward to speaking to you again. It was wonderful to see you again, to be able to spend some time together. Thank you again for your expertise and your generosity. And um, we're going to be thinking about this interview for a really long time. And I, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And great to see you again, Jenna. And uh, do stay in touch. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing Smarter.